Welcome all you Zoomers. Welcome to the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum, South Rockland's finest maritime museum. I'm Captain Jim Sharp. This is my little wife Meg right alongside me here. <laughs> and we started this music, uh, this music, we started, <laughs> we've made music a dozen years ago. <laughs> anyway, we started this museum about a dozen years ago, fantastic museum. We have so much memorabilia now, we're full. We've just built a new building. We have so many things going on and really exciting. This tonight is our 19th Captain's Quarters broadcast. Can you believe it? 19 different vessels we have uh, explored their history and explored their current uh, activities. And it's just been a great thing to do. We have had so much fun at the museum doing this kind of thing. Uh, right now, I want to move ahead just a little bit and we want to talk about the most recent uh, donation that we have, we have to the museum, a wonderful donation by Captain Bob Pratt. My gosh, it's the morning in Maine, the vessel, she's a Rockland vessel, a catch that has been running in and out of Rockland for more than 20 years, 22 or three years now. Beautiful little vessel, look at this, my God, what a gorgeous shear she has. Beautiful little catch rig on her, nice vessel, and uh, they Bob Pratt gave it to the Sail Power and Steam Museum. Now that's quite a responsibility. I want to tell you, we took that responsibility on, uh, not casually. Uh, we took it on with great feeling of responsibility. We have to keep this vessel together now. We've got to keep her moving. We've got to keep her doing her thing and preserve her for the city of Rockland. Beautiful little peat colored design vessel, great substantial, colossal clipper valve there, <clears throat> and a well-balanced rig on her. We'll get into more details of her construction and so on as time goes on. But first, first, we got to get into a little bit of commercial. Now, don't touch that dial. We'll move ahead here. And uh, I want to tell you that there's so much going on at the Sail Power and Steam Museum. We have so many little legs sticking out of this octopus and different things going on. My gosh, right in the center of this photograph, you can see our new building with a flag flying. This picture was taken in the fall, the very last of the fall before winter came on and the snow flew. And there's the last rose of summer on the, on the rose bush in front, the foreground. Beautiful big building. We've got 4,000 square feet. We're going to be putting all kinds of wonderful antique boats in there, as well as other displays. And uh, we're quite excited about filling it up with uh, a whole lot of wonderful memorabilia. Since our old museum, still active and still will be active, is so full, we'll be able to expand into this new building. Let's go around clockwise up in the upper right-hand corner, two o'clock. You can see our marina. Well, of course, you see the dinghy dock in the marina, but you can see how busy we are in the summer by the number of dinghies at that dock. We don't have very many spaces for transient vessels. We have most of the rest of the, the marina is taken up with our endeavor with uh, sailing classes. Uh, an extension, a wonderful extension, uh, an offshoot of the Sail Power and Sea Museum is the Midcoast Sailing Center where we give free youth sail training, where we take kids to age six to 14 years old and we teach them, we give them a week long sailing class. Tell you more about that later. We have wonderful certified instructors and uh, we have a great program for education, not only with on board the vessels, but we have a classroom as well. <laughs> we teach navigation, we teach all phases of, the navig of uh, maritime chart reading, uh, anchoring, uh, underway, how to set your sails, how to efficiently sail, right from the get-go all the way up through to uh, a very experienced thing. We'll, we'll teach you to see it. We'll teach you all facets of it. Down below, six o'clock, this is our sail program for kids, our skiff program. You gotta remember that skiff program. These are little Optimus Prams. These are little tiny boats. These guys are out. Guys out there and they're racing, they're racing around that buoy right there. My God, look at this, one of them out ahead of the others and he's really fortunate There's one tagging along behind the whole fleet and they're all racing just as tight as they can go. Think about their telephones? No way. They are too busy to think about anything like that. Over in the left side, 
rent our tent. We have this great big tent, 40 by, by 80 foot tent, huge, huge tent. And we can use it. You can rent it for whatever your function is. Get married. Get married in our tent. Have your reception there. Have lunches. We do parties. We do concerts. All kinds of wonderful things with our tent there. You can go down on the beach, get sand in your toes, and roast hot dogs on the fire right there. And roast marshmallows, too. We have side curtains that will come down if the weather's kind of inclement. And that will take care of that. So think about running our tent. Give us a call. Up in the upper left, that's the friendship sloop. We have two wonderful friendship sloops. Have you ever seen a more beautiful sailing vessel than a friendship sloop? They are gorgeous little boats. And this little boat we use not only for sail training, we take people out, adults for sail training, uh, and groups for sail training, and men and women, we show no discretion. We take anybody that is interested and wants to really learn the fine points hands-on with a friendship sloop. This boat, Persistence, and Blackjack, the other boat we have, a little bit bigger than this boat, two wonderful friendship sloops. Well, I'm all excited now. I'm getting all steamed up here. I gotta tell you about our SCIF program, SKFF, Sail Kids for Free. Remember that, Sail Kids for Free, SCIF. These little boats, these are SCIFs, commonly called SCIFs, but actually these are Optimus Prams. They are world-class, sailing vessel. These little blunt bow things, and you look there, these guys sailing these boats out there, there's one guy to each boat, just one man, one captain, that's all it is. He's got to perform if he's going to make that boat go. That's what we do. We give them a whole week, Monday through Friday, of sail training. These kids go out there. They're, this must be maybe a Wednesday or Thursday because they're out in the outer harbor, They're going around the buoys, racing each other, over on the left-hand side there, there are the kids when they first come, they don't know anything about a boat. They don't know a rudder from a centerboard. They don't know anything. And we teach them, we show them how to rig their sails. We take those little boats, shove them overboard and give them a push away from the dock. We have a chase boat that goes out and tells them what to trim and how to trim it, which way to pull your tiller and make it go. And these, these kids, they have minds like a sponge. They're absorbing all of this just as quick as they can. And it's just absolutely wonderful to see them get out there and learn. You, you can see the expression on their face. They light right up and they learn how to control these boats and really make them go. It is an incredible experience for a kid. An incredible experience. One guy, one guy in a boat, one captain, and he's out on his adventure. And it is just amazing how they respond. You know, um, it, it's a given fact that uh, kids average over eight hours of screen time, eight hours of looking, and that's not counting the time that you do their homework. The average kids spend eight hours before a screen. That's terrible. It, it leads to uh, obesity. It leads to depression and behavioral issues and all that kind of thing. Get this guy out on a boat. Get him out on a boat, and he'll get a sense of independence. He'll get a sense of responsibility and uh, camaraderie and uh, just everything you can think of. Uh, there's nothing like a sailboat to make a guy think ahead and see where he is. And it's an experience they'll carry on for the very rest of their lives. Well, this is the way we do it. We have to pay our staff. We have to have our boats. We have to keep them up. We got to buy sails and rigging and all that kind of stuff. Donate to SCIF, SCIF program. You got to donate to SCIF. Donate a hundred bucks. Everybody can afford to donate a hundred bucks to our SCIF program. We will guarantee you a bonus. We will put another kid in another boat. We'll do two kids for your hundred bucks. What a deal. Two kids for a hundred bucks and get them out there. Look at these two kids on the left, on the right-hand side. They're going off. They have learned how to sail. They're running off before the wind together. And buddies, and you can't beat that. Donate 200 kids. You get four kids out there. 306 kids. Don't write up to 500, $500. You can, a business can do that. Like falling off a log, a $500 donation will put 10 kids, a whole class out there, learning how to sail these boats. Look at this guy over on the left hand there. I am the captain. He said he's got one hand on the sheet and the other hand on the tiller, and he knows what he's doing. He's out there sailing that boat by himself. And boy, it is a very rewarding thing. 
And you know, as we say right there on the bottom, we couldn't do it without you. We could not do it without you. So donate to the SCIF program and keep these kids sailing. And that brings another thing up here. If you uh, donate a substantial, well, make a, a reasonable donation to the SCIF program, you get a free book. We'll send you a free book, one of my books with Reckless Band, one of my, I'm 88 years old, and I can't remember in my memory being without a boat, being in some kind of a boat, a freight boat or a sailboat or what, something that floats, whatever floats I was on. And uh, these are my memoirs, um, and most of it's true. You know, they say that uh, with, with reasonable... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, don't get me laughing. <laughs> with um, reasonable discretion, you can maybe do 10% exaggeration. You have to do it tactfully <laughs> and tastefully, but... Uh, uh, it's okay. It's okay. Those are, uh, you get a signed copy. Give us a donation for the kids. On we go here. We're glad. <laughs> my, my wife kicks me in the ankle when I get to talking too much. That's why I walk with a limp. Okay. Open the curtains here now. We want to take a look at this beautiful, beautiful hull. The substantial hill hull of the morning in Maine. Pete Culler, an amazing guy. He, he had a bent for work boats. And uh, honest boats, uh, boats that are not too gaudy, and boats that are really practical. And uh, he put an awful lot of his personality into it. And you can see by this beautiful shear on this vessel, you can see by the wonderful vessel that uh, the kind of thing that he was interested in doing. He uh, was asked to do catches. He started to sketch catches out from little centerboard boats all the way up to a substantial boat like the morning in Maine. And uh, these are some of the sketches that he did in trying to develop a, a catch rig that was uh, acceptable. Uh, during the 1960s, well, the, 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 in the middle of the 1900s, there was a lot of hoopla about the catch rig. William Atkin was one of the uh, ones that for, for leader in the catch rig. And uh, it was very popular in those days that Tahiti Catch was talked about as the vessel for bad weather to go around the world in. Of course, she was a burdensome, heavy rig thing and, and uh, uh, a very seaworthy catch. But uh, that was the talk of the time. Pete decided he would design one for himself. They designed this little vessel, this little catch rig vessel. Interesting boat. No heads to bother with. They didn't want to bother with that. He wanted a simple rig, something that he could very easily handled by himself, <clears throat> or certainly with maybe one other person. You can see the gaff rig, the, the poor gaff probably had two halyards on it. Uh, the mizzen gaff, however, only had one halyard, which uh, raised that gaff up and uh, seemed to work all right. Well, too bad he developed the, the, uh, the design, but uh, it was never grown to fruition. He never did build that vessel. But he did, did build this vessel, the fundamental benefits of a catch rig. It's really interesting. Catch rigs have a lot of advantages. That little mizzen back there, about the same size as the jib, of course. The jib takes the, take the big four triangle up there. And you need a bowsprit to offset all of that sail, that mizzen boom sticking out over the stern. But that's all power. That's all power for a vessel when you need it, when you need it in light air. Uh, of course, the size of that jib could double easily as a mizzen staysail, which would go between the mainsail and the mizzen mast there and give you a tremendous pulling power. I used to say, I used to have a, a yawl, a Malabar yawl, John Alden's Malabar 11, 44 foot yawl. And we had a mizzen staysail on that. It pulled like a team of mules. It was a beautiful, beautiful sail. This boat is a lovely sailing vessel. This boat is a is no, no slouch. This vessel moves and has a tremendous sail area. He's got just the right height of mass. And the mainmast should be just twice the length of the boom. And uh, uh, you can see that, that gorgeous shape. You can see an awful lot of thought went into that. The mizzen is a great place to put your radar. It's a great place to uh, have a wind generator or all those kind of things. But one of the nicest things about a mizzen mast is that mizzen boom that sticks way out over the stern. 
Now, my wife may give me the devil for telling you about this, but you get a lobster fisherman and uh, you find a lobster boat going around and around in circles, still underway, and nobody aboard it. You know something's wrong when they finally get out there and prowl that vessel and find the fisherman that was in it. 90% of them have their flies open. Well, now you know why they're lost. That's one wonderful thing about a catch rig that doesn't boom out there. You know, you can stand on the fantail where the motion of the vessel is moderate. You can hang on to that mizzen boom out there and be very comfortable enjoying the scenery. <laughs> well, it's true. Now, I got to tell you, I'll bet you Steve Lennon, I'll bet you Kevin Steve knows about that kind of thing. But I'm going to go on here. We've got to go on and uh, we'll get Steve up here pretty soon to partake of some of these other things. Uh, of course, uh, as much as we partake the beauty of a catch rig, the, one of the wonderful beauties of it is the fact that you can stow that mainsail and go under jib and jigger. There it is with the mainsail all stowed, stowed all the uh, gasketed down in good shape and uh, pretty as it can be, stowed away where you don't have to worry about it. I don't know exactly what's going on in this uh, picture. The, uh, uh, yeah, it was blowing about 40 and it, uh, she, was, she was riding kind of nice. Yeah. I don't remember the red line sticking in there. Where did that come from? The what? The the line hanging off the um, the pin I'm trying rail. To, I'm trying to figure that out. Somebody has drawn on it, and it happened once before, and I can't figure out how to. I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> on the top of your screen. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> that is one of your mistakes, Steve. No, Does sir. <laughs> We'll try not. <clears throat> well, I wanted to ask you what's going on with the mizzen here. It looks like the boom's goose winged or something. The no, she's on the old. It's on the old goose neck, and it, and it uh, it's uh, it rides, so it's it's probably rolled over a little bit. Oh well. <clears throat> okay. Well, it looks like it's blowing up a breeze of wind there. A hat full of wind. And you just got the old the old jib up there going like mad, huh? Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, great. That sounds like a main accent there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> we, we try. It, it, it infiltrates somehow. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Well, now, 1970, I understand William Wood. He went to uh, Pete and he said, Pete, I want you to design me a vessel. And uh, Pete Culler, he's interested in schooners in those days. He wanted to design the schooner for Mr. Wood. And he says, no way, no way. He was pretty insistent. He wanted Swan, <clears throat> swan 5 to yep. catch. Yeah, that was a hell of a fight. It was right right until the time that she got the uh, ballast got poured in the ground. He was trying and trying and trying and almost got it. Is that right? I, just wanted to throw it. I just wanted to throw this in right now. Uh, it was... Uh, it was March 15th in 1970 that she was launched for the first time. So she's exactly 52 years old today. Is that right? She's 15 yep. years old today. Well, happy birthday, my God sakes. I didn't know that. I'd have, I'd have put up a balloon or something. Yeah, I wouldn't have sent Tyler down to wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> See, that's great. And uh, yeah, she and uh, Mr. Wood owned her for 28 years. Yeah. And you were there the whole time? Uh, all but one cruise to uh, the Caribbean. I missed that. Oh, one, one cruise to the Caribbean. And why didn't you go on that? I did something stupid, like going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> Went back to school for a winter. Oh, well, we all make those kind of, those kind of mistakes. My hey, gosh, you were... You were with her better than a quarter of a century, though. You were with her. That's really amazing. Yeah. And you did some work on her when she was finishing up to, in advance of her launching or after her launching? Uh, I helped finish do this, a lot of the, some of the furniture down below and did a lot of the finish work. I uh, did all, of, all the fine finish um, rigging detail and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it just helped out doing yard, yard work. Yeah. Now you were you were telling me that you had been sailing on a Concordia yawl before that. 
Right. As a matter of fact, I was working for Mr. Wood for that. It was a 3910, the smaller version, Concordia, y'all. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you hastily told me about a hurricane, but was that in this boat or was that one in the yawl? That was in the yawl. It was a Bermuda race. We ended up sailing around the eye of the small hurricane. <clears throat> so the rest of the fleet was sailing into Bermuda. We were, we were doing loop to loop. So I'm now <laughs> waiting to come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had suffered some damage? Uh, not, in that, not in that one. Not in no? that one. No, no matter we're going down the Caribbean, she got in a she got on a false storm. The one that anybody remembers that one of Pete Collins' schooners was uh, Integrity, and she got knocked down in the in in the same storm. Yep. Uh, one uh, or Morning in Maine rather lost the mizzen boom, uh, tore the tore the sail right off the boat. Uh, but they oh, yeah. they grabbed the they were able to save the hardware and stuff to for a new one, but. Uh, she stood right up fine to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's a lovely vessel. Look at the shear on that vessel. And from the quarter, of course, that's a, always a good way to take a picture of a vessel. Look at the tumble home she <clears throat> she has there. It's just a delightful transom of that big heart shape with all that tumble home. That yeah. uh, nice vessel. And she's moderate displacement and uh, moves quite well. She was quite a contender, you told me. Hey, uh yeah, in in heavy weather, she she she'd give a uh, some surprising boats a, a run for their money. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> oh. Yeah, actually, Pete, the the rig that's on her now was was uh, was one that Mister Wood forced on it. Um, oh. She was uh, color wanted to put another eight, another thirteen feet on the on the main and another eight feet on the mizzen. You can imagine that. Right. I, I think he I think he had Chesapeake on the line when he was thinking that. Bird's head? Hmm? No. <clears throat> you did a little carving work? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I, that was the uh the uh figurehead that I carved for the boat a couple of years after she was launched. Mm -hmm. Who did the stern board? Uh those uh those are Pete's. I did the one. I I redid the hails for the uh, when she went to uh, to Castine. Pete did the the stern boards and the and the uh, the side boards and the stuff on the bowsprit. That was the kind of stuff he did uh, did after supper. He just escaped. <laughs> he escaped to the shop, and you'd find him out there at a, at midnight, whacking away on a on his carvings. Right, yeah. And th this is her in the middle of, I don't know what kind of a, um, an array of boats. Wh where is this? That's 4th of July, uh, 1972, I believe, in uh, yeah. Cutting, Hunk Harbor, Cutting Hunk Harbor. Well, they had just a few boats in there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, uh, every once in a while, I get a breeze going through there and cleaning the whole place out. But uh, yeah, it's kind of scary the number of boats they used to get in there. So I go into Pulpit Harbor with my schooner and find two or three other boats. I say, "When the devil's going on here? Town meeting?" <laughs> yeah, you guys, get, you guys got some spoiled of a day, I tell you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you let all these foreigners in. You really made a mistake. <laughs> We should close the border, shouldn't we? <laughs> uh, wait, don't let me in. This is a nice, nice picture of her laying down here with these commercial boats down on the right-hand side. What's going on there? Hey, uh, that was the morning she uh, we we brought her into Castine. I think oh. the 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 main is just outside. Uh, you can't see her. She's over to the right there, and the Bowden is the Bowden's up against the dock on the other corner. Oh, uh, that's the tugboat then off your stern. Yep. That, that's the Maine Maritime Academy tugboat. Huh, yes. Mm -hmm. hey, yeah. And uh, this is the same picture over in the lower left uh, from a different angle. Yeah, that's right. That was from the bridge, uh, the state of Maine. Oh, the state of Maine. You were up on the bridge? 
Yeah. Did you take that picture? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this this picture, she's got a hat full of wind there, keeping her going. Yeah. yeah. And I like I like your comment. Uh. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I, I think she, she, Pete designed it extremely well for exactly that. She, uh, she really, she really flies at that point of sale. Uh -huh. And uh, she, she really has a lot of, a lot of power, a lot of sail area for that hull. Great. Yeah. So William Wood decided to, what, what, what influenced him to the main, uh, donate it to the Maine Maritime Academy? Do you know? No, <laughs> uh, he he wanted he well he wanted to he wanted to see it go to somebody who would appreciate it, and he figured if he gave it to the academy, the academy could make something on it on it at some point, but if they could also you know the cadets could use it, and then hopefully somebody uh, somebody who want, who would care for it would get it afterward. Yeah, and none of, none of his family could care much care care less about being on a sailboat, so. That, that was a perfect match. Well, that's the thing. Right? You accept these vessels, but you really got to accept the responsibility of keeping them up and keeping them alive and, and uh, really appreciating this, that fact. We feel oh, that, yeah. that responsibility, too. Well, now, of course, we go into that phase of Andy Chase and the Maine Maritime Academy. Andy, are you on here now? Andy Chase, uh you can... I'm here, Jim. I'm right here. You can hide, but we're going to get you. <laughs> I, I pretty much knew that, Jim. Welcome, Captain. Welcome. We're, we're glad to see you. And uh, I wanted to brag about you a little bit. Of course, Andy Chase was one of my career, one, one of my crew. And uh, were you, uh, you worked your way. How long, were you on the adventure two years, one year? Uh, one year plus some jumping in time occasionally, yeah. Well, that's about all we could stand of you, I guess. No, yeah, that that was pretty much all you could stand of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, you're, Jim, you remember I used to swear in my sleep, and you almost fired me for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I'd forgotten all about that. Your language was abominable. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't remember a thing about it in the morning. No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, you are you still swearing in your sleep? I have no idea. My wife is kind enough to leave that out of the morning conversation. <laughs> <laughs> wise, wise lady, wise lady. Well, you are certainly a, a major part of the Maine Maritime Academy over there. And you've been there a long time. You, how many years were you there before you retired? Uh, let's see, 34 and a half. 34 and a half, yes, sir. How can I be that old that you were, God, amazing. Well, you know, I'm only 35 years old, Jim. <laughs> oh, is that right? Prematurely bald, I guess. <laughs> well, anyway. Great, great. Um, Andy's bent, of course, with sailing vessels. He loved these sailing vessels, great big uh, traditional vessels, uh, gaff rig vessels, those kind of things. And uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful crewman. I remember he was all over that vessel from the very top of the mast to the very keel of her. Amazing. Now, master of the schooner Bowden and uh, led the Bowdens' first trip back to the Arctic ever since McMillan's last voyage in 18, 1954. And you got all the way up to 70 North Latitude. Good. And written two yeah. books. Is that right? We're going to sell these books tonight? Sure, sure. Sell them all you want. Actually, it's really one book, but there's a second. That One on the left is the second edition. <laughs> well, we've got to brag about it and make it, we'll call it two. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> so, see if you can sell both of them to one person. <laughs> great. That's great. There you are, right there, my G. Yeah. So, tell us about the curriculum or the sailing course that you conceived. Yeah, well, actually, that's how the book came to pass. I, I had no, I, 
I never dreamed that I could write a book, and I was probably right. But um, uh, I had this idea to start this course on uh, sailing for professional sailors, and I was hunting around for a textbook and realized there wasn't one. And it occurred to me that if I was clever enough, um, if I wrote a lecture a week, well, I had two lectures a week, actually, by the end of the semester, I'd have a book. So as long as I could stay, you know, one lecture ahead of the students, at the end of the semester, I'd have pretty much all the material I needed. Um, so that's pretty much what I did. And um, the so the course was for people to sail big old slow boats, really. And um, that's that's what it worked out to. And it, it's run for, I don't know how long. I can't remember when we started it, but it's quite a while. And it's going to run again next fall. I've, I've retired, as you mentioned, but uh, Eric Jurgensen is going to teach it next fall. And um, when we got, every year, we, you know, Maine Maritime would get these donations of boats of various kinds. And I always made sure that the waterfront director knew that what I wanted was a big, heavy catch uh, to teach them on. And when Swan 5 came along, I just swooned. I, I she was perfect. She was exactly, not only exactly what I wanted, but she was gorgeous to boot. And it was, it was, it was a real privilege to get to sail that boat. So Steve, I can't tell you, I never met you. I don't think I ever got to meet you when you brought her over, but boy, did we appreciate that boat. We only had it for a few years, but she was exactly what we wanted. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, just enough space and just the right kind of just the right kind of rig for kids to really get comfortable on a boat. Yeah. What, what, what I was really after was, the reason I really wanted to catch rig um, was to really get them to understand balance and understand that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd make them sail all over the harbor without touching the tiller or the helm in that case, um, so that, you know, they really get that, so that it becomes instinctive and intuitive so that they don't have to think about it. Yeah. And, we would start out sailing out in the middle of the harbor with lots of sea room and going around in circles and round and round in circles. And then gradually I'd move them in closer and closer and get them into our MMA mooring field amongst all the MMA boats there where there's lots of things that they got to avoid. And then yeah. after that, I'd move them over to the town mooring field where there were a lot of boats that MMA did not own. <laughs> And that's where they really had to pay attention. And then, and then we'd step it up and, and we'd have them docking and undocking under sail. And that, that was pretty exciting. And when they completed that, then we took them out for a weekend on the Bowdoin and did all of that on the Bowdoin, but not, not docking and undocking, I'm afraid. But, uh, but out in the middle of the bay, they got to handle the Bowdoin and learn how it was done on there. So it was really fun. Yeah, that's, a, that's a wonderful step up. I mean, that, yeah, you're right. I mean, she she balanced she balanced out just all too well. There were a number of times that uh, that Pete went out with uh, Mr. Wood, you know, early on when he just got in the boat. And Pete would Pete would be at the helm. He tell he tell somebody to pull a little twing here and a little twing there, and then he get up and he get up and leave the helm and go over and light his pipe. And the, yeah. you know, she just be sailing through the harbor. Mr. Wood was over there quaking in his boots. <laughs> uh, you know, I just didn't understand that kind of, uh, you know, faith in a in a boat. But it was she was she was nice and true to the to her to her hit her, hit her to her lineage. Yeah, and the, you know the thing, the other thing that I really appreciated was that she was heavy. She was a heavy boat, so they they really got a feel for a, a bigger boat, even though they weren't on a big boat. Um, but it, it was uh, it was just right, and and in fact. Uh, another gentleman whose name escapes me, and I'm sorry it does, but donated the lovely Crocker schooner Puritan, little 35 foot schooner, mm -hmm. and we would alternate weeks, one week on the Puritan and one week on Swan Five, so they could get a flavor, a, a feel for the schooner rig and the catch rig. So it was a really perfect combination. Yeah. Hey, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing to do! What a wonderful way to teach these kids. And the Coast Guard gave you credit for it. They were excused from the license exam, he said. And, yeah, that's uh, right. They didn't. They didn't have to sit the license exam, which the, all of us here who've taken it know that that doesn't excuse much. That was a pretty pathetic exam. So, uh, but uh, nonetheless, that did, and it also gave them thirty days of sea time, which was great. Yeah, 
Tell me, Andy, is there any other Maritime Academy in the country that teaches under sail? Well, not yet. The uh, Mass Maritime is, is building out the Ernestina, a rebuilding out the Ernestina, and, and uh, they plan to start up a program. Um, it hasn't started yet. When they finish the Ernestina, we'll, I, I think that they're going to have a program there. We're going to follow in your shadow. Well, uh, maybe so. <laughs> it's a great thing, great thing to do. It's high time this damn country get busy and, and start teaching under sail. But there's yep. so much to be learned there. Yes, that's true. Yeah, well, I thank you for doing that. I think that's just great. Well, and, it was also a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the next owner, Captain Bob Pratt acquired her in 1998. Brought her to Rockland, ran her as a successful charter and Dave Tripper. And uh, as she made a very good, very good vessel for that kind of thing. And uh, uh, Bob certainly was a great credit to the organization, a great credit to uh, Morning in Maine, keeping her going as the current role in the passenger trade. There's, there's the first mate with him. Life is too short to have an ugly boat. Life is too short to have an ugly boat. Look at that beautiful shear in that vessel. She is, as you say, Andy, she is an absolutely beautiful vessel besides being able and all the rest of her qualities. And there she is at the dock. <clears throat> Bob has her there all gussied up, painted out and washed down, ready for, ready for people to come aboard. Uh, Bob, where are the people? <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're coming down the dock. <laughs> they're, they're, they're on their way, are they? <laughs> that was pretty exciting, your first, your first time sailing her in and out of the harbor, I guess, was it? Uh, yes, it was. Have you uh, been, did you have a long experience with sailing vessels before you got the morning in Maine? Uh, I had a Bristol 35 at the time that I got her, and I had a boat prior to that, um, but I've been uh, on the water. Actually, I think I learned to swim before I learned to walk. Uh -huh. uh, and so I had uh, both power and sailing time. Was that uh, as a yacht or were you doing it commercially? Uh, when I was born, I probably wasn't doing it commercially. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I started my commercial career with my 35-foot bristle Terrapod and sailed oh. for a couple of years. I was looking for a bigger, better boat, and I took Terrapod into Castine one uh, trip with some passengers, and uh, I had taught at Maine Maritime Academy, so I knew where uh, Andy's mooring field was. And I saw on five in the mooring field and fell in love with her shape. Mm -hmm. So I went to um, the um, waterfront director, Bill Harmon, and I said, hey, Phil, I said, tell me about that boat. Oh, he says, that's one of those donated boats. He says, we've had it for a couple of years. He says, we're going to sell it this fall or next spring. And I said, if you could wait till next spring, I'll buy it. He <laughs> said, okay. That quick, huh? Yep. So they kept it for the whole winter. I didn't have mortgage payments or anything. They maintained it and everything else. And I picked it up on June 16th. Uh, and sailed her home to Rockland. That must have been a thrill. Uh, and the, the Academy had done such a beautiful job keeping her up that my first run was on the 17th, when I, the day after I got home with her. <laughs> great, great. Well, Go back and yeah. look at the pictures that Steve provided, all of her uh, bright work was quite up to the uh, line underneath the cap rail, and that was black. And I didn't like black, and I asked the Academy if they would paint it blue, and they said they, they would, and they did. And so she's wow. been ever since. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Um, Jim, we, Jim, we have a question um, in, the, in the chat from somebody asking if you can get the specs on the boat, the displacement and all that. I don't know if that's a question for Steve or, or who's, who's got that information. Bob probably has that. The best place to find that is in uh, Colors, Skips, and Schooners. Yeah. See Colors book. I don't, I don't have them on the top of my head. She draws six foot six. She weighs 47,000 pounds when we launched her last spring. She weighs about, or she weighs 47,000 coming out and about 44, 45,000 going in. Uh, she's 46 feet on deck, 46 is six, and 55 overall. So if I'm bragging, I said she's a 55 foot boat. If I have to pay for dockage, she's 46. <laughs> uh, 12 feet wide um, and she carries right now 935 or 945 square feet of sail on the Coast Guard regs. Did that answer the question? Well, yeah, pretty yes, pretty it did. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> this picture apparently, I think this is C's picture. Uh, yep. Apparently you're watching the Racing in Penobscot Bay? Uh, that's that's right. That's in Castine, as I remember. Oh, and I think, yeah. Yeah, we just we had just gone in there one night for uh, you know on a cruise. Oh, really? Yeah, uh -huh. and, and the two schooners there just happened to be doing part of their uh, part of their weekly, I think. Well, that's me on the right hand side in the adventure. Hey yeah. Uh, and over on the left side is Bud Hawkins and the Schooner Mary Day. Yeah. And it looks dangerously like Curtis Island there in the background. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. But we, we frequently on Friday would stage a race. And uh, it looks like we might be racing in that picture. Just for, yeah. the, for the interest and for the enjoyment of the passengers. They get so excited when we would take these two big schooners and race them and cross paths back and forth and sail dangerously close to each other, but we thought it was fun, you know. But, uh, Jim, you're only, Jim, you're only calling that a race because you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm not going to deny that. that. I'll, I'll, I'll take the credit this time. <laughs> Bud Hawkins, the Merry Day was a, a hundred gross ton and the Adventure's 230 ton. I needed a breeze of wind to get the Adventure going. So in light tacking duels and things like that, the Merry Day would win. When it came on to blow, I would win in the adventure. And it was great because neither of us lost too many times because the, the, the winner always had to buy the drinks. And I lost <laughs> one uh, often enough that I was uh, enjoying the drinks. <laughs> but I think that's what that day was all about. That, well, I don't know what you're doing anchored right there, just enjoying the show, I guess, Steve, huh? Hey, yeah. Yeah. Well, wanted to put this in there. This is a little incident about uh, the morning in Maine. Bob, maybe you can tell us about this. <clears throat> Recognized as uh, uh, the vessel that traveled the furthest to attend this function. And uh, best sailboat last the year before and runner up this year. And leading the parade of, parade of sail. What's this all about, Bob? In the year 2000, uh, Morning in Maine went to, I guess it was Salem, Massachusetts, uh, not dead sure, to the uh, classic and antique boat show. And uh, she was on the dock and being visited by all of the uh, judges, one of which was um, Mr. Stevens. Uh, the one that wrote the book, uh, I've, I've lost his first name. But at any rate, he's walking around under, on, inside the boat and he's looking around and he says, nice boat, nice boat, this is nice boat. And I didn't really know much about it or think about it. And she turned up winning sailboat of the year in the year 2000. So I assume that, um, Seeing that was the beginning of the new century, she probably won 
uh, sailboat of the century. Um, so we went back the next year in 2001 and they said, you can't win twice in a row. We just don't allow. It. So I think I came up runner up or something. Yeah. Uh, hey, that's great. That's great. So, and uh, you were testing some kind of electronic stuff. Uh, As a matter of fact, Steve was involved in that. Yeah, Steve, Steve was there. One of the uh, companies that was doing uh, mapping called MapTech. And he made me a beta tester. And we uh, navigated from Rockland down there using this uh, unproven but uh, very uh, significant uh, electronic device. Uh, and when it came time to put the boat in the, in the dock, uh, <clears throat> we were under GPS and using the map tech program, we turned her around and backed her in and you could look at the radar or the GPS system and you could see her actually sitting in the dock slot, uh, which was unheard of at that time. Uh, nowadays you can move the device from bow to stern and tell the difference, but in those days, it was pretty amazing even to get it into a harbor. Uh, no, it was the work that Steve was doing on that. He can give you more detail about it. Isn't that amazing? So many electronic devices now that it makes it pretty easy. Yes, it you know, does. <laughs> you know, we, the, you, I got the adventure where we went 10 years with nothing but a lead line and a compass. No radars, no any of that stuff. And boy, I was scared to death half the time. So <clears throat> moving on then. <clears throat> here are the old reprobates right here, aren't they? <clears throat> yes. None, none of you guys have changed very much. You've changed your shirts, that's about all. <laughs> you all look the same. Very... <laughs> What's that? This was that's at the very bunch. This was at the boat show in 2020 uh, in Rockland this summer. Was it last summer? Last summer, yeah. Yeah. 21, I'm sorry. And this was the first, I hadn't seen Andy in years and years and years. And Steve was visiting me and Andy came up and, and reintroduced himself. And um, then he disappeared for a while. And we were off doing something else. And I thought, jeepers, I'd really like to get a picture of the three of us. And Andy showed up again. And I grabbed uh, um, Steve and Andy and got together and we got this picture. So those are the three um, captains of the boat. <laughs> For her whole life. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> And here's the vessel getting ready, <clears throat> getting ready to go over, we're getting painted up and uh, uh, waiting for the travel lift to pick her up, I guess, and get her in the water. There's something about this travel lift, I'm not sure what was going on there. She's on the lift and on her way to the launching site. And uh, now, Bob, tell me about what's going on here. Was there a this is the important one. There was a person, this is at Knights Marine, and they have a combination of boatyard and parking lot. And people that go to the islands will leave their vehicles there. And they usually lock them up and they usually give them uh, the keys to uh, the, peop the people at Knights Marine. And there's a number in there so that they know where the keys are and everything else. Well, this particular vehicle parked right underneath morning in Maine, and they couldn't find the keys. <laughs> and uh, it was locked up in such a way that they didn't dare drag it with the tractor and get it out of the way, but we needed to launch. And the operator of that crane was so superb that he actually tipped the boat sideways and went over the top of that car and got it out. And the car never moved. <laughs> 
uh, and, and it takes more than one picture to see this whole thing, but it was a phenomenal piece of artwork by the operator of that crane. Notice on the left-hand side, the, the boat is actually tipped. He had to pull the keel away from the side of that car so that he could get that boat out. Uh, they're very, very excellent at Knights Marine. You, you have the masts in her there. Did you normally saw her with the masts in or? We would take the masts out in the fall and put the masts back in. And we usually would put them in while she was on the poppets rather than in the water. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, but if we took the masts out, we could store them inside. Varnish, they would like her and be, survive better. And we could build a better shrink wrap. because you know, your soul does Good. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Great. Well, it's something when you have to dodge automobiles in order to get launched. Yeah. <laughs> so they finally got her over and got her ready to get in the, into the water. Hmm. Isn't that pretty? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty. Mm -hmm. Old hat for you, we're doing that every year, all these years, Bob. Quite a lot, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Still nerve wracking. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they are rigging up. We're going to have triadic stay. A couple of pictures around on deck. She has a lot of bright work. Yes, there is. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, Tyler's got to pay attention here. Keep that bright work up. I oh, gee, that. Going to be, going to be, <laughs> the bar's been set high. The be a, way to yeah. increase the size of your boat is to put a paintbrush in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <clears throat> well, some different pictures down below here. I don't have very, very many good pictures down below, but her below decks are really quite luxurious. They're really quite impressive. Hey, Bob, did you ever get to go cruising in her? Uh, a couple of times, particularly the day we brought her home, uh, but also when we went down to those boat shows. Um, Kathy and I, and actually uh, Steve went on one of the trips. Um, so we did a little cruising, but primarily we stayed and did our job. Yeah, she looked like an awful lot of fun boat. It must have been a lot of fun to cruise on her. Uh, yes, it would. Yeah, it was, it was like living in a cottage, it truly. It was, uh, she was very comfortable. Certainly, too. She draws a crowd, I'll bet you. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> you can tell she's a lively boat. And there's the gang on board. Now we're starting to make some money. <laughs> uh, take people out, give them two lighthouses and a, a tour of the harbor. Is that what you did, Bob? Yes. And we got certified for 21 passengers. And actually, when the Coast Guard decided that they were going to go from, I think it was 165 pounds to 185 pounds per person, they redid her stability test, and she qualified for 28 passengers, if I wanted to weigh them. <laughs> I found it very difficult to, to ask some rather large old person to step on a set of scales. <laughs> we stayed at 21 passengers routinely, but it did allow us to take um, like a sixth grade class out or something like that, where we knew that the kids would be well under 185 pounds. Uh, so a couple of times we've been out with larger groups than 21. Looks like the... Uh... Coast Guard Eagle there, the 
Bark Eagle. Yes. Must have been. Uh, was she visiting Penobscot Bay? She came to Rockland um, once or twice, but at least once. Uh, and we were part of the escort to bring her in. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, that looks like the heritage with a merry day in the background, left side, and some of the other schooners. Must have yeah. been Windjammer days in Camden, or Windjammer days in Rockland? In Rockland. Mm -hmm. and, and we were always a part of that. Uh, we didn't get involved with the races that came down from Islesboro, but we were there at the finish line. And that gave our passengers a great chance to get some beautiful shots of some gorgeous boats. Yeah. We were probably up in the lighthouse there and welcoming them in. We, did Many that. Times we saw you in, was it Rankin? What was uh, your... Uh, steamboat. Uh, what was that? What was the name of your steamboat that you had? Rancor? The, the John record? Moore? I think record. you're talking about the record. Record. The record. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've seen you out there a number of times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah, we did have the record out there quite a few times. Sunsets. Everybody loves sunsets. More passengers watching the scenery go by. Twenty-two years of it, Bob. You might be a little bit tired, huh? Yeah, it was actually the last one was twenty-three, and um, uh, I, I am tired of it. But I feel like Tom Brady. You know, I'm ready to go back. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Looks like lobster served here. That's my lovely wife serving lobsters for a lobster dinner. Oh, it that's your wife. Yeah, I've had much of one. What we call meals on keels, <laughs> which is a lobster dinner on board. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> How did you get them cooked, or you didn't cook them on board? Well, we had the capability, but uh, not the time. So we would have uh, Jess's Market cook them for us and the corn and put them in a cooler and deliver them to the boat just as we left. Nice. So they hot and ready to go. Well, now this is quite a picture. My family. <laughs> is that your family? Yeah. Do you want to introduce them? No. <laughs> <laughs> this was a group of individuals that were at that 2000 um, antique and classic boat show. And they uh -huh. did a pirate event and came on board. And, you know, I've always thought of myself as a pirate because my job was to fleece the American public. Uh, <laughs> so I thought I did. <laughs> Uh, I, I take people out, I take their money away from them, and if they're really good, I bring them back. Now, isn't that piratism? <laughs> Pretty generous of you to bring them back. Yeah. Well, he charges extra for that, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tyler, I made a lot of money renting life jackets. Who's the mate there? That one is... Um, that's uh, Rudder, uh, who's the one that we have now. He's upstairs asleep now. He's a three-year-old, two-year-old Labrador retriever. But prior to that, we had Poco, which was a yellow lab. And prior to that, we had Lobo, which was a yellow lab. So the boat's been through three yellow labs and a black lab uh, in her time period. Yeah, well, you got the black lab down here, too. Yeah. <clears throat> And then Captain Bob very generously donated the morning in Maine to the Self Power Steam Museum. We, we uh, accepted this incredible gift with uh, uh, very much appreciation. And uh, as I say, uh, assuming the responsibility of doing something worthwhile, 
with this vessel in order to keep her alive and keep her sailing and keep her in Rockland Harbor. We had a number of occasion to uh, lend her out, sell her, and let her go to uh, someone out of, out of state. And uh, we refused it. We wanted to find a way to keep her <clears throat> doing her thing in Rockland Harbor. After all, she is part of the harbor. She's uh, certainly been doing her thing here all these years. And uh, uh, we're proud of it. So with a much grateful expression for your generosity, there's you with the, this is the Black Lab? Maggie, yes. Maggie, uh-huh. And uh, we certainly do appreciate your doing this for the Sail Power and Sea Museum. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that you've done. Keep her sailing. Yes. Yeah, we're going to try to, that's for sure. So there's a rainbow. Uh, we're going to follow, keep things, keep things on track here. So the first thing we did, of course, take the masts out of her and we hauled her out of the water. Uh, you say she's 50, 54 feet long. Well, we put her in a 40 foot building. So she's kind of sticking out, but uh, she's in undercover for the winter. And uh, so that we can get organized and get uh, things together and find out a future for her. So in our search for a new captain and a new life, a new beginning for the morning in Maine, we came across Tyler Waterson. Tyler, I know you're there. And uh, I'd like to have some of your first impressions here. You, you weren't quite sure in the beginning what you were going to do here, but after a while, you came around. Tyler? Well, I, uh, to be honest, I went in and talked to Captain Sharp. I thought I was maybe going to get a part-time job taking people sailing on the weekends or something along those lines. I didn't really know what I was getting into, to be perfectly honest. And uh, kind of we said, well... <clears throat> we didn't know at that time either. I was making it all up as I go along. <laughs> I said, oh, Jim Sharp, I've heard of him. Well, that's worth a conversation at least. Oh, don't believe a word of it. <laughs> I went in there thinking, oh, maybe I'll be a part-time sailing captain because I was getting a little bit burned out just driving power boats around in circles. I am a sailor and I really wanted to be doing more sailing. So I said, oh, maybe that would be a good little thing just to keep me going while I uh, have my day job driving power boats. And by the end of it, Captain Sharp was uh, pretty much convinced me and said, go out and write up a proposal and come back and we'll talk this over. Yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. I can call it. I can talk a cat off a fish wagon. <laughs> I think one of the first things I said to my fiance when I got home is, "Man, he is one charming old sailor." <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave us a nice proposal, and uh, we realized from that proposal that you were interested not only in sailing the vessel and not only in trying to make a living with it, but you had an affection for her history and an affection for what she is and what she stood for and our connection with the Sail Parency Museum. So we felt that you were the guy. But my wife says, what? You came over, you talked, and you talked, and you refused. And then, well, what is the boat. Let my fiance see the boat. So you went to see the boat, and then you came back and you said, "Let us think about this." Again. <laughs> right? It's true. It's true. Uh, Captain Sharp's not the only charming one. <laughs> yeah, Morning in Maine definitely got her own charm. It was, uh, yeah. At first, it felt like a lot to take that leap. And uh, we didn't really know what it looked like, and we were still trying to figure things out. And we said, my partner and I said, ah, I don't know, this might be too much for us right now. But we uh, we went down and walked around the boat a little bit, and she definitely helped seal the deal. So now the work begins. First thing we got to do is get a coat of paint on her, get her gussied up here, and get ready for springtime. And I guess you're 
You're on track now to do that, huh? Absolutely. Yep. We yeah. uh, been a lot of computer type things and getting getting the uh, booking system going and getting some people booking sales for the summer. And now the weather's breaking. It's time to get out the paintbrushes. <laughs> yeah. Well, a few more pictures here. Look at the way she's all gussied up there. Beautiful, beautifully painted and uh, just everything done to the nines. That's the way you're going to keep it, I'm sure. Yes, sir. So there's a smile on your face now. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to that, uh, that being Penobscot Bay. That's someplace in California, I guess, isn't it? That is actually a uh, main, well, it's an Alden designed schooner. And I think oh. we are right off of uh, Tacoma. We're in the Puget Sound, South Puget Sound in that picture. Oh, really? Uh huh. Oh, yeah, Deer Ago, too, though. That's a uh, boat with some, some Maine roots. I think she actually ended up coming back to Maine and uh, coming full circle. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was a Paul Ship Festival in 2017 out in Puget Sound. Yeah. Well, you're a happy man there. Got your thumb up. You're going to keep that going here on the coast of Maine. Just a few odds and ends of pictures here. Uh, sunsets and lighthouses, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Al's head is certainly one of the most attractive. Bob, you went by Al's head quite a few times, I guess, didn't you? You know, but you know Al's head from four to aft, backwards and forwards. Yes, I would say so. Two to three times a day for 23 years, for like 150 days a year. Yeah, yeah. You know that. Over, I think it was 17,000 people on board. In her yeah. Time. And the old moon coming up over the lighthouse there. There's nothing like the state of Maine. My gosh, we've got some gorgeous scenery here, some beautiful places to sail, some amazing, amazing country. Always astounded me when I take the winter off on the schooner and come back the first week that I'm out to see all the islands and see all the wonderful, wonderful uh, little jewels of islands. It's a magnificent cruising country. State of Maine is unique. I don't think there's another place in the world that can compare to the state of Maine. And uh, every sunset is a magnificent one. I certainly traveled around a bit looking for that place, Jim, but there's a reason I came back. <laughs> yeah, we all do. There. That's, uh, that's you in front of the light station. <clears throat> yeah, that's East Brother Light Station. That was an awesome opportunity. That's what uh, my partner Tiffany and I were doing before we came back to Maine 2020. We uh, ran the Ben Breakfast. It's a original 1874 Victorian light station. I still had the operating foghorn from the 1930s and right out in the middle of San Francisco Bay. It was quite the experience there. I saw a video of you starting that machine. I guess it's a compressor that you're starting up and uh, old equipment. You have to start by hand and then a throw full all start the pony motor. Yeah, pull yeah. start pony motor, and then that got the uh, the 1934 Caterpillar engine fired up, and then you'd clutch that into the Ingersoll Rand compressor with the big four foot uh, flywheel on it, <laughs> and then you would open up the six inch gate valves and fill up the 20 foot tall uh, receiver tanks, and yeah, it kind of makes me want to play around with some of the equipment over at the Sail Power and Steam Museum. I miss it. Yeah. Well, you're going to be spoiled. All you have to do on Mooning in Maine is push that button. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she is a beautiful vessel. You got to take care of her. She's a gorgeous thing. And uh, we're going to be proud to see her going in and out of Rockland, doing her thing out of the same dock that she started with and uh, uh, doing her 
regular route back and forth. People are fascinated with uh, lighthouses and uh, we've got to show them all the main lighthouses we can. And there's your partner. Two, yep, there's my better half, Tiffany. Two happy people with a lighthouse in behind. My God, that's a great photograph. That is a great photograph. Couldn't do any of it without her. There's the bow of the old vessel headed out to sea. Where did they get all these pictures? <laughs> I gave them past the lighthouse. Gosh, there you go. Well, we certainly wish you bon voyage. We wish you all the luck in the world. Uh, this is the end of our program. And uh, now there's a chance for anybody that has any questions to jump right in, ask some questions, see if we can't find an answer for you, and kibitz a little bit. I want to tell you right off that this is the 19th Captain's Quarters production that we've done. We've done all of these others, this whole list here. All of this is on YouTube, so if there's any part of it that you've missed, you can go right back to YouTube and click on it and go on our website. You can link right through from our website and bring up any one of these uh, Captain's Quarters productions telling about the different vessels. There's, of course, the schooner Bowden there. There's a schooner Roseway there. All the, all the vessels of the main fleet and tell us about all their history from the Victory Chimes all the way down to the Isaac Evans. So there you have it. Are there any questions, any comments? Anybody Question, any Jim? Questions? Curious, Jim, what, what's the plans in terms of crew uh, on the morning in Maine for her operations this year? Say that, say that again, Keith. I'm group. just wondering what, what the plan is. Are you going to have a deckhand on the boat as well, or is, is uh, Tyler going to be single-handing? Well, no. Uh, for, for a full load of complement, I think we have to, we're required to have a crew. Yeah. I think you can single-hand if you only take six people. Is that right, Bob? That's correct. Yeah. So he'll, he'll have a crew. Tyler, what did they, you have anybody in mind? Uh, yeah, I've got a... A good friend of mine, George Williamson, he's going to be a uh, crew for, I think, most of our sales. He's committed to to uh, sailing from May right through October. Good, good. Well, yeah. that's, you got things pretty well under control. That was definitely a big part of the puzzle, but uh, he's an excellent guy, and uh, he's going to be a good, reliable crew. There you go. I'm sorry, Keith. I guess Keith was maybe shopping around for a job. I don't know. Keith, is that right or not? But of course. <laughs> well, you know. Well, <laughs> On the other hand, I'm going to have my catch in the water this year, so we'll see you out there, Tyler. Oh, that sounds great, Keith. I look forward to it. Hey, Bob, there's a question here in the chat. Somebody asking what's involved in changing the name of a boat. Maybe you'd like to talk about why, how you changed the name and how you ended up with the new name. Well, legally, I guess you can change any name of any boat. And when we got her, uh, we thought Swan 5 was not uh, a name that would uh, elicit a lot of um, interest and response for passengers. And I wanted the name, the word Maine in it. So we looked at things like mainly the life, uh, the main event, and morning in Maine. And we settled on that one. Then you made it a morning in Maine. Well, the company was a, DBA was a morning in Maine, but the <clears throat> boat was only morning in Maine. Uh, but I put a morning in Maine together because in those days, if you were, uh, first in the alphabet, you got first listings on the internet. Ah. Nowadays, that probably is not nearly as important, but I would get first listing on the Chamber of Commerce and the internet and uh, things like that. So having A was a very important um, part of the booking part of it. Very good. Very good. Any other questions? 
Okay, well, it's been a great, uh, great evening. I've learned a lot, and I thank you guys very much for coming on and uh, uh, doing your t thing, telling us about your memories of the the old vessel and uh, the history of her. So, we're going to take the summer off. We're going to go sailing. We may continue our uh, expedition here with the captain's quarters in the fall. Uh, keep tuned and uh, see what we come up with in the fall. But uh, we've got plenty to do over the summer, running the museum and our sailing school and all the rest of the things. Keep in touch. Come see us. Come see us at the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum, South Rockland's finest maritime museum. Captain Jim Sharp signing off. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you. Good night, all. Captain. Great job. He's the dad. Thank you. Bye, Pammy. Night. See ya. Bye, Pammy. Bye. We can't see anybody. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>